Hello everyone. So this is our second case of our uh, four cases series where we discuss uh, deteriorating patients on the ward. So this patient here is an 82 um, years old lady admitted uh, through the ED. As a background, we see hypertension, hyperlipidemia, ischemic heart disease with a stent seven years ago for a non STEMI, uh, type 2 diabetes, lower back pain, and chronic kidney disease, and a history of uh, hysterectomy for benign disease. Uh, in the drug history, we see amlodipine, atorvastatin, aspirin 75, clopidogrel, uh, metformin, and solpidol for her pain, um, lower back pain. So she uh, was admitted three days ago uh, with a low respiratory tract infection. Uh, she was febrile on, on admission on a chest x-ray, uh, right uh, lower lobe pneumonia with a weak cough um, and an ABG was taken at the time. So that was the ad admission. Uh, vitals, a uh, heart rate of 110, as you can see blood pressure is kind of normal. Uh, capillary refilling time is 3 seconds, uh, oxygen saturation is 86 on room air, which is low, and the respiratory rate is 33, um, temperature is 37.8, and her GCS is 14. So on the right you see the blood gas, and if you wish you can um, stop the video now for a couple of minutes and try to read the ABG there, and uh, try to understand what's going on. So um, if you did not pause the video and you just want to uh, carry on with the lecture, so I'll, I'll just interpret it for you. So the first thing you read in an EBG is the pH. pH is 7.3 and so we have acidemia. This is called acidemia. Um, not acidosis. Acidosis is the syndrome, so it's, it's the cause of acidemia. So uh, pH is 7.3 is called acidemia uh, because it's actually it's the blood that is acidic. So acidemia. And the cause of that, if you read the second thing to read uh, in an ABG, is the CO2. CO2 here is 7.2, which is quite high. Uh, so we can already tell from here that uh, we have a respiratory acidosis. Um, P, so this, the third thing to read is the is bicarbonate. So HCO3 is 25. It's uh, slightly above the normal. Um, so there's a, a maybe an initial... Um, attempt to compensate the acidosis, the, sorry, the respiratory acidosis. So we have a slight metabolic alkalosis uh, trying to compensate the respiratory acidosis, although clearly it's not enough. It's just, it probably has just started. And then from here, you can observe that the PaO2 is 8.4. So you have um, hypoxemia. Um, so basically, this is an ABG of someone who is having um, a type 2 respiratory failure. So it's, um, it's um, a ventilation failure uh, because you're having high CO2 and you have an oxygenation failure because you have a low PO2. So just move on here and we're not going to discuss the details of this ABG. And so from here uh, we are in front of a community acquired, acquired pneumonia and your assessment is done following the British Thoracic Society guidelines. Um, those guidelines, uh, if you read them, and I will leave a link into the description here, uh, you might want to download the article there and read it because that's uh, really relevant for you as a new interns. Um, shortly, you will be uh, you will be facing this uh, this particular clinical condition quite often. So um, yes, you have your initial assessment, uh, triage, and then uh, you do your chest X-ray. It's reviewed by a clinician, and there is a consolidation. Yes, there is. So from here, um, you treat according to your clinical judgment, or um, and uh, by doing by you know assessing the CURB sixty five uh, score severity score. So CURB sixty five severity scores uh, assigns one point for each of the following features. If there is confusion, if there is urea above seven uh, millimoles per, per liter, if you have a respiratory rate above thirty, and you have blood pressure uh, below ninety systolic, or diastolic below sixty, and one point if the age is above sixty five. So in our particular patient here, uh, patient was confused. Yes, so there's one point there. Uh, urea was uh, normal, so zero. Respiratory rate was above 30, uh, so that's another point. Um, and blood pressure was normal, and the age was 89, so uh, was one point. So we had three points uh, with our patient. So if you follow the flow chart here, the algorithm tells you that you are in the high severity risk group, 
uh, with the mortality uh, risk of you know 15 to 40 percent so uh, in this uh, flow chart it's, it is suggested to you know uh, have the patient in the hospital and give supportive care um, carry some microbiological investigations and uh, give antibiotics uh, where required we need an urgent senior review and uh, discussion revolving around whether to admit or not to an intensive care unit Okay, so that's your um, overall assessment of someone, you know, coming into the hospital or to ED with a, with a, with a pneumonia uh, community acquired. So antimicrobials, uh, as, uh, as mentioned in the flowchart, you have to start to think in terms of antibiotics uh, if you have a, an LRTI. So um, you can follow the app that is provided by the university um, in the chapter of uh, pneumonia, community acquired, acquired uh, pneumonia uh, in the respiratory system. You find uh, your um, suggested or recommended antibiotic treatment according uh, or following the CURB uh, 65 score. So we said that we are three. Uh, so the suggested regimen here uh, for first-line antibiotics here is coamoxiclav IV, 1.2 grams every eight hours, plus clarithromycin, um, 500 milligrams every 12 hours. If patient is allergic to penicillin, you can choose with ceftriaxone IV plus clarithromycin uh, or levofloxacin, uh, plus consider adding vancomycin. Okay. So um, those are recommendations and, uh, you know, uh, uh, recommended regimens and it's really handy to have this uh, app uh, to use um, when you encounter this uh, particular clinical scenario because it can be confusing at times. So okay that's your initial assessment and management you are dealing with a you know a relatively simple uh, clinical picture there uh, you started your antibiotics um, and then you know daily chest physiotherapy for uh, mobilizing the sputum uh, we noticed that the trimonin is uh, slightly raised, uh, but no, no, not a big deal, really. No major clinical signs or symptoms going on there. Patient uh, restarting high, uh, antihypertensive treatment that were held uh, for a couple of days. Uh, and then the pain team comes because the lady has uh, lower back pain and she's complaining it's worsening because she's been, uh, uh, you know, um, she's been lying on the bed for a um, couple, two or three days now. So she's starting to feel uh, more discomfort. So they prescribed uh, BD oxycontin and oxynorm. So those are opioids. And uh, yes, are good pain relieving options, obviously, as opioids, they're uh, strong uh, painkillers. Um, but you know, opioids can sometimes impair with the with the respiratory rate. You know, they can depress the respiratory function. Okay. So you're called to review the patient after a while. Um, you know, the the following day or um, yeah, the day after. Yeah, in the morning they call you. The patient is drowsy. Uh, she was falling asleep repeatedly. Um, whereas she was, you know, sitting out the previous three mornings. Uh, she didn't, didn't eat her breakfast today and she hasn't taken her medication. She wasn't able to, to take her medications. Uh, her vitals are the following. The heart rate is normal. Blood pressure is slightly increased. Uh, but like, you know, she's a hypertensive patient, so that's expected. Uh, saturation is dropping to 89% on room air. And uh, your Glasgow Coma sco score, um, you know, she, you assess her brain, you know, her, her mental condition. And she appears asleep. Uh, you know, she doesn't really uh, respond when you call her uh, or try to shake. So you apply some pain there. So you apply some pressure on, on the nail bed. And uh, the response is that she opens her eyes briefly. Uh, she moans and groans and she moves in, in her bed uh, briefly, you know, reacting to pain. So if you wish, you can try to pause the video for a second and try to come up with a G GCS score there. Okay. So if you did not pause the video, uh, I'm sure you didn't. Uh, the GCS here, for someone who's not, uh, who's opening the eyes only for pain, that's at a two. Uh, moans and groans again is another two uh, after pain, and uh, move reacting to pain, um, that would probably be a four at uh, as described here. Um, so what 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 is going on here? Uh, what do you think is going on, and uh, what would you do? What's your differential diagnosis, and what will be your initial uh, management? Okay, so for the differential diagnosis, I would suggest you to think in terms of systems and, you know, from the top down, uh, the, you know, the main three systems to consider are the main uh, three core 
assistance, so neurological, is been uh, has there been a trauma? Has she fallen from the bed and hit her head? Uh, is there a spontaneous bleed going on? Is there a stroke? You know, seizures uh, or an infection? You know, meningitis and and encephalitis or malaria. Uh, circulation is the patient in shock, circulatory shock, so she's, you know, uh, altered cognition or mentation. Uh, respiratory function is the patient hypoxemic, hypercarbic, so that would justify the confusion or the, resp- or the, the CNS depression. Uh, metabolic, uh, hypohyperglycemia, DKA, hypohypernatremia, hypothermia. Those are all causes of, uh, of, um, um, of CNS depression. Uh, GI is the patient having a hepatic encephalopathy or is the patient having an increased uremia? Um, so the last one will be toxic. Is the patient under the effect of alcohol or sedatives like uh, benzos, opiates, etc. Or um, intoxication of carbon monoxide? So again, as I said in the previous lecture, when you are asked uh, what is going on with the patient who's deteriorating, uh, if there is a patient in front of you who's uh, you know came up came with a, with a presentation and, and deteriorates over time, and you want to understand what's going on there, uh, when you're asked this question, what uh, people want to hear from you is uh, the way you think, and the way you think is that you have to give a differential diagnosis there and think in terms of system, uh, take a step back and try to you know observe the big picture. So what could be going on here, and you know try to give um, you know reasonable answers uh, and then after your initial differential diagnosis uh, you want to say that you want to undertake uh, some investigations all right but before that uh, you want to do an, an assessment of the patient so uh, the, a very helpful tool for your assessment is again the early warning score uh, chart which is filled by the nurse at the bedside and you just grab that from the from the chart and you actually go through it because that's a really handy tool and it really gives you some clues and can help you with, with the management really. So respirate again here, you go through the system, uh, respirate is a three, so you give it a three, each patient is on oxygen, another three, and the set is low, so we're already at nine. Uh, blood pressure is normal, heart rate is normal, so those are zeros. Um, AVPU responds uh, to pain, so that's a three, and the temperature was normal uh, at this stage, and it's at zero. So it's overall use score of twelve, which is quite high, as you remember from last uh, lecture. Um, you go through the escalation protocol flowchart uh, that you find on the use chart, and uh, so if the patient is having a use score above seven, then yes, you have to involve everyone here, uh, you, your senior colleagues, your registrar and then the, the consultant uh, looking after the patient. The senior doctor has to review the patient immediately, and then you know there has to be a discussion, uh, perhaps involve the ICU team, and discuss whether it's suitable or necessary to transfer the patient to, to a higher level of care. So yeah, we were talking about investigations. After you had you have done your uh, differential diagnosis, your initial assessment, you know that the, the, you know the situation is quite serious here. Uh, so you 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 do your investigations here um, again because when you call senior help, those things should already be uh, done. So basically, blood, uh, basic bloods, uh, FBC, coag, UNEs, and LFTs, and you can see here the results, and you know there's something going on, but nothing really major. Um, ABG, uh, you do an ABG because that's what's recommended in the in the actual um, use chart. Uh, if you remember when you go to respiration and uh, you go to the ABCDE uh, that you find on the left side of the chart, it is suggested or recommended to perform um, chest X-ray, ABG, in ACG. So that's your ABG here. And again, if you wish, you can pause the video for a couple of minutes, try to read it um, and try to go uh, in the way I described. So pH, CO2, HCO3, and then PO2, and uh, try to think of what's going on here. Okay, so uh, let's read it together. Uh, pH is 7.3. Again, uh, P, I, PACO2 now is 9.3, which is quite high, uh, significantly high. Um, high. HCO3 is 27, so there is now a metabolic uh, alkalosis um, that is trying to compensate the respiratory acidosis, but it's not enough, as you can see from the pH. So the, the respiratory acidosis is quite significant, and the lactate is, is normal. So uh, despite the low oxygen levels in the blood, the patient is still able to oxygenate his tissues. Okay, so this ABG um, is telling you that 
the patient is having uh, a problem ventilating. So there's a ventilation issue here. We know that the patient is having a low respiratory tract infection and the patient is under antibiotics and physiotherapy, uh, but uh, something has um, deteriorated his uh, or her um, ventilation uh, function. As you remember from the lecture on respiratory failure, uh, you know, respiratory failure is given either by um, a ventilation failure, so inability to pump air in and out of the lungs, or a problem with the diffusion of oxygen from the lungs to the bloodstream. So in this case, uh, we call uh, the first type where we have a ventilation problem, it's called type 2 respiratory failure, when you have a, a problem with oxygenation and CO2 removal because the patient is not, not able to move air, uh, basically. And the other, uh, the second one is called uh, type 1 respiratory failure, when you have an, a problem with oxygenation alone. So ventilation issues can be given by a variety of causes. Uh, and if you remember from the lecture on uh, respiratory failure, which I recommend you to go and, and uh, review, um, ventilation failure can begin by, by depression of the respiratory neurons that are found in the, in the uh, brainstem. And this is given by increased CO2, by drugs such as you know, uh, opioids or uh, sedatives, or uh, certain conditions uh, such as uh, increase of intracranial pressure, stroke, trauma, or tumors. And then you have the upper motoneuron uh, conditions, uh, mainly trauma of C3, C4, so uh, frank nerve damage. And then you have the anterior horn cell, and then the lower motoneurons, uh, for example, secondary to surgery or to Guillain-Barré syndrome. Then you have problem with the neuromuscular, neuromuscular junction, and this is typical of myasthenia gravis. And then you have atrophy of the actual respiratory muscles in, in case of you know myopathy or COPD or low blood, or low, uh, um, blood perfusion. Uh, then you can have a loss of elasticity of the lung when you have pulmonary fibrosis or, or these other conditions that you can read there. Uh, you can have loss of structural integrity when you have a trauma. And then you can have an airway obstruction, which can be given by upper airway obstruction uh, or small airway obstruction like COPD or asthma. So these are the reasons for a ventilation failure. And again, I, will, I would suggest you to review the lecture on respiratory failure to get into the details of all that. In terms of oxygen failure, oxygen diffusion failure, um, as we discussed again in the previous lecture, you can have the issue lying in, in three possible uh, places. It can either be a vascular problem with a pulmonary embolism or um, if there's a problem in venous, venous congestion. So, so there's a problem in actually um, having the blood uh, flowing uh, between the, the, the alveoli and oxygenating the blood. Uh, you can hear, you can have a problem within the interstitial space, or you can have a problem within the alveolus itself. So the alveolus can be filled with uh, secretions or mucus, or like you know, um, the result of the actual infection, uh, or there can be a problem with the collapse of the alveolus uh, due to the obstruction of the alveolus itself, or an exterior force such as a pneumothorax. Okay, so what is going on with our patient then? We have said that the patient have a uh, low respiratory tract infection and she presented and she was managed according to the guidelines. So, uh, she was receiving antibiotics and physiotherapy and all that and uh, she was mobilizing. Uh, but then uh, something changed and, um, and she started having a respiratory failure, uh, type 2 respiratory failure because she was uh, building CO2. She was retaining CO2. So what do you think went wrong with the management of this patient? Again, um, you know, you, you, your assessment is done as we described. You know, you have your assessment of the overall condition, looking at the flowchart. Uh, you call your uh, senior help, and uh, you start to think of the possible problems. You have your differential diagnosis, you have your labs, you have your ABG, and you might have your imaging there, chest X-ray. Uh, now, we don't have the chest X-ray here because the ABG was kind of uh, enough uh, to describe the problem here. Uh, and the problem is that um, the patient was receiving opioids and for her back pain. And when you give someone who is already having a respiratory uh, impairment, a secondary to low respiratory tract infection, opioids are probably not um, the ideal choice in this case. Uh, because again, you can um, end up with uh, a depression of the CNS and therefore you can have um, a decreased uh, ventilation of the lungs and therefore a worsening of the clinical condition.
So your initial management would be basic resuscitation measures. So you follow your ABCDE algorithm. Um, because again, you know, the patient has a low GCS, uh, so you, you want to control the airways, uh, breathing, circulation, etc. You call senior help according to the protocol, and then you start your basic oxygen supplementation, as we discussed uh, before in case one. And then you might want to start treating the possible cause of CNS depression, in, the case, in this case the opioids, so opioids is reversed with naloxone. Um, so there you have it. That's uh, a, a small interesting case of uh, someone who's presenting with the uh, respiratory uh, problem of um, com community acquired pneumonia and who deteriorates over time. And then, you know, the way to approach approach the um, deterioration is again uh, repeated. Uh, you have to have a, you have to take a step back, uh, look at the big picture. Try to um, dis discuss possible uh, alternative uh, differential diagnosis, and then you start from the basics: uh, your physical examination, uh, uh, investigation, so labs, ABG, and chest X-rays, ECG, and then you focus on uh, what you think could uh, the problem be, and um, and start your initial uh, resuscitation measures or initial management. So there you go. This was case two, and thank you for listening, and uh, see you next time.